John chapter 4. We continue our journey through John. Today we pick up in verse 19. It's the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well continues. Jesus has now gotten her attention. As last week we saw when Jesus told her about her life and told her how she had been living her life, her eyes began to open up. She began to see herself in a different light and realize, she began to realize that this is this is not some just another Jew. This, this man is not like all the other Jews that have either mistreated me and put me down and not wanted to have anything to do with me. This man is really cares about me. This man is engaging me in conversation, in meaningful conversation. And we see that right as we pick up in verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. In other words, you're not even like anyone else that I have ever met. You're not like anyone else that I've, that I've ever seen. And Jesus begins to, as they continue to come, come, uh, have a conversation, it begins to move toward the subject of worship. It begins to, to transition somewhat. Because the scripture tells us there in verse, in verse 20, it says, Our fathers worship in this mountain. And, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said, Woman, believe me. An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship what you, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you and me. Can you imagine that moment? I mean, I mean, Jesus, she's been standing there talking to this Jewish man. She's finally catching on. You're a prophet. You know things about me that I don't know how you knew it, but you knew it. And then she says, I've heard about this Messiah that is coming, and Jesus says, I mean, I'm the one. God is seeking out worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That doesn't mean that, that God is, is, is seeking to make worshipers as if there were people not worshiping whom he hopes to change. You see, we, we all worship some. As a matter of fact, John Calvin said, he said, our hearts are idle factories. And what that means is, is that on any given Sunday, when you and I come to, to worship, we have a decision to make. We're either coming here to worship God and focus upon Him, or we're, we're bringing something else in our hearts that is more important than God, and we are going to be worshiping that. You see, sin does not, sin does not make us non-worshippers. Sin makes us worship something or someone other than than the living God. We have, a, we have a tendency sometimes to get focused on the creature rather than the creator. We have this tendency that is that is in, in all of us. That's why that, that we can come to we can come to worship, come to church on any given Sunday. And we can profess the faith. We say that we, we believe in, in Jesus Christ as our as our Lord and Savior. We can we can participate in a Sunday worship service. We can we can go through all the motions, but yet at the same time we may have hearts that are far from God because our focus and our attention is not upon Him, it is upon someone or something else. We all can have a tendency to have an idolatrous heart. And we have to be very careful about it. An idolatrous heart can, can be a heart that is focused on someone other than God, something other, other than God, but it can also be a part of our lives if we, if we come to worship and we perform our duty as a Christian, but we do so without delight. We do so without any joy, any, any real enthusiasm. A.W. Tozer said, worship is the missing jewel in the evangelical church. I think that's something that we, we need to ask ourselves today. Is that true for me? Is that true? Is it true for you? Is it true for our church? Is it the missing jewel of the church? Let me give you a working definition for this morning's message about worship. Worship is my personal response to an encounter with the living God. 
Worship is my personal response to an encounter with the living God. So let me let me just ask you this one. You don't have to you don't have to respond. It's just something I would like for you to ponder this morning. Here we are about halfway through the hour today. And I just want to ask you, have you worshipped? Okay? Have you worshipped yet? As we as we move through this time. Some of you may be saying, well, Brother Craig. Worship time's over. It's preaching time. <laughs> as, if there is a, as if there's a difference. Let me tell you something, folks. If I preach God's word and, and God does not prompt you to react and you are not able to respond in, in some way to what God's word is, is saying to you, then, then I'm not doing something wrong. As we, as we expound on the word of God, as God speaks to our heart through his word, we have a response to that. We react to that. And that is a part of our worship. That's, that's a worshipful response. It's not, we, we, we will have fake worship just to be the music part of it and the preaching part of it. I just got to sit there and listen. Well, if you're listening, we respond as God speaks to our heart and as he, as he touches on this. But we really need to answer the question, have I, have I really worshipped? I wonder how many may have left the church from time to time somewhat disappointed. You go to lunch and you get to the house and you say something like this, you know, I, I really didn't get much out of it today. I didn't get much out of the music. I didn't get much out of the solo. I didn't, I didn't get much out of that sermon. Or maybe you said, well, you know, I was doing pretty good until they just they sang that song. That song just ruined it for me. Or, or when I looked at the at the order of worship and I saw what the preacher was preaching on today, I just I just saw that. You know, I had an experience like that this past week. I uh, went to a conference over in Atlanta and ran in. I was going in on the very first day of the conference, the very first morning of the conference, and one of the speakers was a gentleman, a pastor by the name of Mike Glenn. Mike is the pastor of Redwood Baptist Church, and in, outside of Nashville. Very, very large growing church. And I had met Mike Glenn about, about 20 years ago at another conference when he had just gone to Brentwood and I had just moved to Decatur and we had both been personally invited by this pastor to come to this conference and we met. And so it was really the first time I had seen him since that occasion. And so as we were coming up out of the parking lot for the steps to the church, I went over to him and I said, Mike, I'm Craig Carlisle, I'm pastor. Uh, I met you about 20 years ago at another conference. I reminded him, of course, he, he really didn't remember who I was, but in, in his effort to make polite conversation, he said, well, where, where are you now? Where are you pastor now? I said, well, I'm, I'm at the 12th Street Baptist Church in Gadsden, Alabama. And this was his response to me. He said, what in the world did you do to end up in Gadsden, Alabama? <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, I said, well, I'm pastor of the 12th Street Baptist Church, and that's my home church, and and we relocated, and God was just really blessing us. Well, he didn't say another word. Now, he was the first speaker on the program that day. <laughs> <laughs> now, I didn't leave, but I was on that. <laughs> I knew it didn't matter to me what he said. It didn't matter to me what was in his message. I didn't listen to the word he had to say. He lost me in the parking <laughs> I, I thought, what in the world? You know, that's what I want to say. Who do you think you are? You know. How do you know that? Who do you think you know about Gadsden, Alabama? But anyway, nonetheless, we've all had experiences where we when we come to worship and you know it, it just it just doesn't click for us and, and we go home and that's our Sunday lunch conversation. That's our our time uh, as we reminisce about what has happened that morning. But it also reveals to us a misconception that I think many of us have about about worship because worship is not something where we come to get something. It's where we come to give something. I think we forget that. And we we come not to, to just receive, but we come to give glory and honor and praise to God. Now let me let me hasten this that we do not give. We do not come and we give worship and honor and glory and praise to God. We receive a blessing there. It works both ways. We come to give, but in the process of giving of ourselves in worship, we have the opportunity to, to receive. 
And I'm just saying, you know, if, if your motive, when you come to church, if all your motive is is to come and, 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 just, and just to see, then you might be just as well off standing at home and watching something on TV. Because we come to give God the glory and honor and praise that is Jesus' name. When we come and when we give to God, we self greatest Christian writers, perhaps one of the greatest, most brilliant Christians of the 20th century, wrote a book entitled God Who Is There. And in this book he says, although God is invisible to our eyes, he is actually there. The function of believers is to learn what God is like and to acknowledge him and to ascribe the worth to him, to reflect upon the value, the beauty, and the character of God. That is true worship. You know, when it comes to worship, Jesus really didn't I have a whole lot to say about the subject of worship. As a matter of fact, as you study the word that is most often used for worship, the word proskuneto in the Greek, it's a word that Jesus actually only used ten times in the scripture. He used it two times when he was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, when Satan told him to fall down and worship, and, and Jesus responded, he said, you shall worship God and God alone. That was two occasions in, in uh, Luke and Matthew. But the other eight times he used it is in this text today. Eight of the ten times that Jesus used the word prosuneta, which means to, to go before them. It's made up of two words, the word cross, to go toward, and the word cuneto, which means to kneel down. Jesus used it here in this passage of Scripture. So let's take it apart for just a moment. Let's dissect this passage for a moment. Several points. Real, real worship is not restricted to time or place. Real worship is not restricted to time or place. The woman at the well tried to take the conversation and make it about the right place to worship. She was standing there in, in Sychar at what is known as Jacob's Well, and just across from there you have Mount Gerizim that is dominant on the horizon from, from that point, and right beside it is, is, is the twin peak called Mount Ebal. And the Samaritans believed that the right place to worship was on, on Mount Gerizim. 300 years earlier, the Samaritans had, had gotten permission from Alexander the Great to build a temple on top of Mount Gerizim. So there was, a, there was a temple in Jerusalem for the Jews, and on top of Mount Gerizim there was the temple for the Samaritans. So they were, they were in competition with each other over where was the rightful place to worship. Where, where should... Where should I go if I want, if I want to worship? The, the Samaritans, as they worshiped on top of Mount Gerizim, believed in the Old Testament. They practiced sacrifice. They had priests just like they did in Jerusalem. But there was competition between the two groups. Our temple is better, better than yours. When I was in high school, and we were especially at a basketball game or even a football game across the stadium or across from the gym, we would holler, we've got spirit, yes we do. We've got spirit, how about you? And the other, day, other side would come back and, and be a little bit louder. We've got spirit. How about you? What I kind of picture this, here's Mount Gerizim and here's Mount Ebal and, and Jerusalem. And you got, you got the Samaritans over here and the Jews down here and there. Kind of yin yang back and forth. Come worship here. We're better than they are. Come worship here in our place. We've got a, we've got a nicer temple. And that's, that's kind of what's in this woman's mind as she stands there. Mount Gerizim is the better place. No, Jerusalem is the better place. And Jesus sets her straight. He said, he says to her essentially, he said, it's not about time or place. As a matter of fact, he says the time is coming and now is where you will worship God in spirit and in truth. Listen, folks, if you don't, if you don't know anything else about what Jesus says to this woman in this passage of Scripture today, please understand that worship should not be associated a matter of heart, not a matter of location. And we sometimes forget that. Some of you say, well, we're afraid for you people really think that person anymore. And I will say absolutely they do. You see, the Jews were people who wanted to put God in a box because he only resides at the Ark of the Covenant of the Holy of Holies. And they would walk over the, you know, they would walk down the streets and they would look at the temple and they'd say, over oh, there's God. That's where he is. And there are still people who think the only place that you can worship is 
in the church. There are people who think that the only place you can worship in the church is in the sanctuary. And there are people that, that tie their worship with the appearance of the building and how it looks and how, and how it feels. There are a lot of people who associate the church building with being the only place that you can worship. But the Bible tells us something different about the temple. It doesn't tell us that, that God's temple is in the church. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, what, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? And you have God residing. Many people have the concept that they'll be the only place. Jesus says, you can worship me wherever you are because my temple is in your heart. God's not, God's looking for consistency in you and I when it comes to our worship. Number two, real, wor real worship is God sent. God is the audience. When we come to offer him our best in praise and promises, he promises to us to, to attend it. Jesus' description of, of worship. He focuses completely on God's expectation. He doesn't ask the woman what kind of music do you like. He doesn't ask the, music, the, the, the woman if this is your preference or do you prefer this. He makes no inquiry into the time she wants church to start. He wants her to, to realize that it is a spiritual necessary for us to even think about this, this elementary thing. Surely none of us here this morning need to, need to be told that God is the center of our worship. But let me remind you again of what John Calvin said. Our hearts are idol factories. We are constantly creating things to worship other than God, and if we're not careful, that will become our habit, and that's what we will do. It tells me that there's a great likelihood that we will that we will come to worship and we will have something or someone else more on our mind than God. And the Bible tells me and teaches me that God is an audience of one. He's the one that I give my attention to. He's the one that I offer, that I offer my praise to. He's the subject of my, of my worship. He scans my heart. He knows. He knows. Real worship must engage my spirit. It must engage my spirit. Jesus twice says that worship must be in spirit. He's telling us that it is a spiritual encounter that we have with God. We, we respond to God by singing, by, by giving our offerings, by raising our hands, by praying and, and praising God because real worship engages our, our hearts. But let me just ask you, have you ever, have you ever had a time of worship that allowed your mind to, to drift? that the words that were spoken or the songs that were sung did not engage your heart? Have you, ever, have you ever come to church out of obligation but did not come with the intent of your soul being broken for, for healing, for adoration, and, and for transformation? That's, that's our failures. That's where we fall short. That's where, where we leave what we need to be bringing inside. That's where we leave it, where we leave it outside. But there, there's also some things that we can look at that are positive. Jesus says, worship must be in spirit. He reminds us that what is really important is not what we see, but the one who remains unseen. It's not what we see, but it's the one who remains unseen. When Jesus talks about worship being in spirit, he reminds us that what is really important is not how long church lasts, but how long we focus on the one who created time. When, when Jesus says, worship must be in spirit, he reminds us that what is really important is not our limitations, but Communion with the one who is never tired, who is never distant, who's never distracted, who's never hurried, who's never late, who's never limited. When Jesus says worship is in spirit, he reminds us that what's really important is not which songs we sing, but that we sing to the God who promises to rejoice over us with the singing. That's what he's telling us. And then number four, real worship. Real worship must be true. Under the old covenant, it involved many outside forms of worship, many external rites that had to be done that pointed that the Messiah was, was the one that was to come. They would offer animals and spill blood and all the rules defined the rituals of, of worship. But Jesus fulfilled all of those and, 
and all those ceremonies that taught Jesus about the Messiah have now come to pass in Jesus Christ. So we fall short, though, when, when we use the, that fact as an excuse to elevate all of our biased experiences that the, we've always said it this way. This is the way I like it. This is the way I like it. We make it all about it. Satan and our flesh conspire to convince us that, that God is only simply by our repentance. We don't need to feel guilt or conviction for sin in, in order to turn from him. But the truth is that my sin separates me from God. And that unless God seeks and saves, then I have no hope. So true worship, when I truly worship God, it makes me see myself for who I really am. Worship in truth also acknowledges who God is. Jesus condemned the Samaritan woman to worship because they worship what they do not know. And the reason they did not know is because they refused to accept the whole Bible as God's word. Whatever sincerity they worked up and their spirits drove them away because they rejected the truth. They could only alone could direct them to, to who Jesus was and understand who he was. Worship and truth honors what one of the greatest tragedies of the church in our day is, is our commitment to simply have it our way. The Israelites during the period of the judges, Scripture says in the very last verse that they did what was right in their own eyes with no regard for what God wanted them to do. And there are a lot of churches that are infatuated with their own opinions and their own preferences. It's not about me. It's Real worship must be through faith in Jesus Christ. The Samaritan woman is now moving from the Old Testament forms of worship to understanding who, who Jesus is. She's, a, she's not going to, she's moving from being dependent on external forms of worship and realizing what can happen in her heart as she worships Jesus Christ. And he tells her why this is possible. He says the reason you can make that transition is because the Messiah has come. No longer does the priest have to enter the Holy of Holies and make the sacrifice while everybody waits outside. You are the priest. And you can go into the Holy of Holies and worship God. No longer does a priest have to pray in your stead. For Jesus lives and intercedes within us and he sends the Holy Spirit to enter us and groan in prayer for us continually. We're no longer dependent on a prophet to give us a word. Because the Bible says the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. No longer do we have to have the Levites who offer the bread and eat the bread in the holy place. Jesus is the bread of life. No longer must the best wine be devoted to Aaron and his son. Because Jesus offers us the wine which is his blood. Jesus takes care of everything. You can worship him in your spirit. Just a few weeks ago, and I will celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. We're going on a trip next week and to the end of next week. And then a few weeks after that, a couple of weeks after that, we will actually celebrate the day of our, of our anniversary. And when that arrives, I suppose I will most likely purchase a car. I will perhaps send some flowers and we may even go out, go out for dinner. And all of that I would do to acknowledge my appreciation for her love and putting up with me for all those years. And that would be pretty good. That would be a pretty good idea. <laughs> but suppose when I gave her those things, she said, oh, thank you. And I responded, don't mention it. I had to do it. So I choose the duty of a husband to acknowledge her our, our anniversary. And if I didn't do it, she would tell the people at church and it would really make me look 
on the other hand, if I tell Tammy that I love her, but I never acknowledge her birthday, I never acknowledge her anniversary, I never buy her a gift or speak of the love that I feel for her, that too falls short. That would not be pleasing. The thing that I want you to understand as we look at this transition in this woman's life as well is that love I'm going to do all I can to communicate that love to her by telling her, by gifting her, by telling others that I love her, by remaining committed to her all the days of, of our life together. And just say that God expects the same thing. That's, that's, that's what he expects.
We're so glad about that and be able to meet all the families and children. You're going to have an opportunity this morning to come and to greet them and welcome them. You pray for them in their time of transition as they move and all the things that go with that. Continue to pray as we uh, seek a place for them to live here in Gates. That has not been finalized yet, so we're continuing to work on that. But you be in prayer uh, for Navy and Captain. We are so glad to have them as a part of our family. Then I want to introduce to you Leon and Harriet and Cam Garman. Would y'all come and stand here with me this morning? Just right here. Y'all come over here. All right. We're so glad to welcome the Garman family this morning. They have been busy with us for a while and they've been seeking the Lord and they come today to unite with 12th Street on transfer of their membership from the Sisters Church here in our county. And we are delighted to welcome Leon and Cam and Harriet today. If you agree with that, would you say a good amen? Amen. 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 And we're so thankful for them and look forward to working with them to say uh, they are a part of our family here at 12th Street Baptist Church. What a great day it's been, a historic day. And uh, I really appreciate uh, all of your support and I appreciate our staff committee so very, very much and all the work that they've done these last several months. So you come by this morning, greet Nate and Tabitha, let them know how glad you are to have them as a part of our staff, and then come by and also greet the garments and tell them that we're glad to have them as a part of our church family. 